tuning in to Astronomy on Tap Edinburgh virtual event. For those who are new to Astronomy on Tap, we are a group of science and astronomy enthusiasts who, under ordinary circumstances, would take over a pub and discuss the latest developments from the world of astronomy. No science background is required. The talks are aimed at to the general public and designed to inform and promote discussion um, and take advantage of the fact that we can have speakers from all over the world in this electronic form. But this time, both our speakers are from the UK. If you have any questions during the talk, please do put them in the chat on YouTube or on our social media, for example, by tagging us on Twitter. So please grab yourself a drink, relax and enjoy a drink in the universe with us. I will now hand over to Fred to go through the April 2021 rocket launches. Thank you, Fred. Hello. Hi, can you guys see this? Cool. Well, welcome to uh, April 2021 cool rocket launches. So uh, it's quite a busy month in, as far as rocket launches go, so I'll try to get through it um, as quick as I can. First up, uh, well, there's been some launches already, but I'll just skip those ones. So first up is uh, a Soyuz MS-18 taking some crew over to the International Space Station. So there's a one American and two Russian going up, and it should be a three-hour flight. And then on the 15th of April, there is a mission handover for um, Expedition 64 and 65. So it's going to be a Russian commander hang, handing over to an American um, astronaut, uh, Shannon Walker. And on the 17th of April, there's a crew return. Um, that we come down on Soyuz MS-17, which is the one that previously de delivered crew. And then on the 18th of April, there's an Indian satellite launch for a geostationary satellite, well, a geostationary satellite launch vehicle launching um, uh, some optical stuff into space, imaging satellites. On the 20th of April, uh, the uh, European Space Agency is launching um, on, a, on a Vega rocket, the mission designated VV-18. So that's a joint payload rideshare. Uh, it's going to be launching from French Guinea. And on 22nd of April, there's a SpaceX launching Crew-2 to the International Space Station. So there's going to be uh, four crew members going up, including two Americans, a Japanese and a European. And that's going up on a Falcon 9 Block 5. And then on the 25th of April, uh, the ESA is launching a OneWeb on a Russian uh, rocket for the, uh, the, the OneWeb Internet Constellation. And then on the 28th of April, International Space Station Crew 1 are returning. Um, so they'll be bringing some people safely back down to Earth and splashing down at 16.35 BST. And then lastly, on the 29th of April, the Russians are launching um, some cool stuff into space, uh, which is actually the core module for the future uh, Chinese space station called the Tiani-1. And that's uh, some pretty exciting stuff to look forward to. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Fred. Um, so moving on from that, I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker um, of the evening, Professor Andy Lawrence. Andy is the Regius Professor of Astronomy at the University of Edinburgh. He's worked around the world, but in his, in his and my opinion, Edinburgh's the best. Andy works on the physics of quasars, which if you don't know what a quasar is, they're an extremely luminous active galactic galactic nucleus, that's all mouthful, which is a supermassive black hole surrounded by a gas accretion disk. He also loves mapping the sky and the virtual observatory. We're delighted to have him give a talk tonight titled Losing the Sky, and in order to avoid giving any spoilers away, I will now pass over to Andy. Thank you, Andy. Hi. Um, well, it's very nice to be here. Um, so I just share my screen straight away. Yeah. Uh, Okay, there we go, and we go on to the first slide, and let's see. Let's see. Okay, cool. All right, so the, uh, this talk is going to be kind of simultaneously exciting and depressing, so sorry about that, um, because there's a lot of bad news here. Um, right, I'm going to start off by showing you three things that I love. Here's the first one. I love the universe. I'm an astronomer and I've spent several decades studying galaxies, 
mapping the sky, and especially as Becky just mentioned, um, uh, quasars and active galactic nuclei, uh, which is what you can see uh, on the uh, the bottom left here. Um, uh, 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 so that's one thing I love the universe. Well, we all expect that. I'm an astronomer. Here's the uh, the second thing I've loved over my whole life, pretty much space. So yesterday was um, the 60th anniversary of the first man going into into space, Yuri Gagarin, and launched on a, a Vostok rocket. Um, here's a picture of, of Yuri Gagarin and myself at about that time. Um, I'm the one on the right. Um, so I was about six years old at the time. Um, so I've been hooked on the, the, the intrigue, the romance, the excitement of, uh, of space and space research ever since. And now I'm a professional working astronomer. A lot of my working life uses um, instruments which are flown in space. So at the bottom there, you can see the XMM Newton spacecraft. Uh, and, and, and I've used data from that many, many times. Here's the third thing that I love, the Internet. Uh, now, again, remembering that I am incredibly ancient, uh, top left there, you can see a VAX 11730. So in 1983, I was sending emails around the world. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Internet did not begin with the web, folks. OK, we were sending emails in 1983 and I was using that that machine there, a VAX 11730. Uh, 20 years later, uh, I was one of the pioneers of the virtual observatory, connecting up data um, uh, via the Internet to make science easier, we hope. I've always been a bit of a social media junkie. Um, uh, I run two different uh, Twitter accounts. I'm the e-astronomer, but I am also uh, also run this Milky Way images bot, uh, random images from our Milky Way map um, every so often. So those are the three things I love. And I would never have guessed this a few years ago, but now those three things are coming into conflict in a very distressing way. So let me try and explain why that is. Right. Um, now, if you are an astronomer, this will come as no surprise to you, but maybe it will for those of you who are not. Um, over the last year, uh, we've been photobombed repeatedly uh, uh, by streaks across our images. You see at the top left there, um, actually, can I just, see, if I waggle my cursor, can you uh, actually see that out there in internet land? So can you see? No. All right, I'll just describe where I'm looking at then. OK, All right. So top left, that's um, an image taken by the Dark Energy Survey camera. And you see the streaks going across it. Uh, these are caused by satellites passing across the field of view. It's not just professional images. Uh, the top right and bottom right, there are images taken by amateur astrophotographers um, photobombed by these streaking satellites. Uh, it doesn't help if you get into space. Uh, middle left there is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And one of these Starlink satellites passed very close, making a horrible bright, bright streak, uh, ruining half the image. Um, it doesn't help if you do radio astronomy instead of optical astronomy, because these things blare out radio communication signals and can drown out what radio astronomers are trying to see from the edge of the universe. And um, to the middle right there is um, a colleague who was trying to take a selfie uh, working in Chile, uh, and again was photobombed by a bright streak. Uh, now you've probably heard that a lot of these problems that are going on and are really worrying um, astronomers, both amateur astronomers and professional astronomers, of course, by um, Starlink satellites, Elon Musk's crew. Um, but it's much more than that, um, as I will explain. Now you might say, well, you know, there's always been satellites, and we're, you know, occasionally we see streaks and so on. But it's suddenly ballooning out of control. Um, so as of the end of 2019, there were about 2,000 satellites um, active um, around the sky. And by a year later, there were 3,000. And you look at the graph bottom right, you can see that nearly all of that very sudden increase is the Starlink project. And there's just more and more of them. Uh, and at the top there, you see an artist's impression of this kind of constellation of satellites. But they're in low Earth orbit and very bright, which is the, the problem. Um, now, the thing is, as I said, it's not just Elon Musk and Starlink. The problem is this is um, everybody's getting into the game. So OneWeb, who we just heard about, Telesat, Roscosmos, Facebook, Amazon, Link, China, Aerospace, 
It's every couple of weeks I hear about somebody else who's planning a constellation. And there were some people in America who examined the filings to regulatory authorities to try and work out what we were heading towards. Uh, and they reckon that by 2029, we'd be looking at 107,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. So our pictures will be photobombed the whole damn time by these things. Uh, and I have to say, actually, the SpaceX people have been speaking to astronomers and trying to help a bit, painting their satellites black and so on. But it's not enough. And there's no way we're going to control everybody coming out of the woodwork and the whole of commercial space kind of exploding out of control. So people are very worried. Um, now, it's not just the streaks that's worrying us. It's um, space debris which is getting gradually worse um, all the time. Top left there, there's a map of all the space debris um, tracked by, uh, by NASA, ESA tracked debris as well. And the bottom right there, you can see the growth of that over time. You can see two big bump, uh, jumps in the amount of debris, wow. which, by the way, is you know, uh, an order of magnitude more uh, than, uh, than the live satellites, all the bits of rubbish. First, there was a Chinese weapons test, and, and then once there was a collision between two satellites, both of which jumped up the amount of debris very dramatically. So um, you know, the problem is that space science itself, commercial space activity and scientific activity, is going to become unsustainable as this problem becomes worse. So something has to be done. Now, what about the internet? Why does that got to do with it? Well, I'm sure a lot of you will have heard um, the idea of um, OneWeb and Starlink is to join up people across the world to make the internet available everywhere. Uh, and that's the PR you hear. It's about you know, giving all those um, poor Africans internet access when they don't have it now. Well, this is a bit misleading because you don't need what they're doing to do that. What it's really about is illustrated by the two pictures at the bottom here. Uh, one is um, high frequency trading. Uh, and now bankers wanted to get signals about the latest stock prices across the Atlantic as fast as they possibly can. And um, Internet gaming. If you're trying to if you're doing real time fighting with other people in League of Legends or something across the Internet, what both of those things need is not just a connection, but the minimum possible delay. It's all uh, it's not really about connecting people up. It's about latency the time delay that it takes a signal to, to travel. So let me get the point across to you. If you look at the top there, most communication satellites so far have been in quite high orbits, typically in geostationary orbit or sometimes in between. Uh, and if you're up in high orbit, as you can see in that top picture, um, you can see you know half the Earth in one go and send a signal to almost anywhere. But there is a bit of a delay in getting the signal back down, about 120 milliseconds. Whereas if you're in low Earth orbit, such as these new satellites, as shown in the bottom picture, uh, the lower one is about where the Starlink satellites are and the upper one where the OneWeb satellites are. You can have a delay of a few milliseconds. Uh, and that's what they want for the, uh, the high frequency finance people uh, and, for, and for gaming. So the trouble there is, as that illustrates, is you then, a satellite in low Earth orbit can only see a little bit of the Earth in one go. So to cover the whole of the Earth and get signals all the way across, you need thousands and thousands of satellites plastering the whole of space. So that's where the problem comes. So you don't need thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit to connect up the world. Uh, you only need it if you want to connect up at very, very um, uh, short latency um, everywhere. Um, oh, my dog just moved on to the next slide accidentally for me. But there we go. We'll do this anyway. So I, I see this as actually a, um, a, a sort of environmental catastrophe. It's, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not as important to humanity as climate change or the loss of biodiversity. But I see it as very similar. It's kind of uh, uncontrolled um, uh, um, human activity, um, uh, gradually spoiling things that we thought we all had. So, you know, last week was uh, International Dark Sky Week, as I'm sure some of you know, and uh, the, the amount of dark sky around the world is getting less all the time. I said that on the left there is a scary picture from Mount Wilson, where in the 20th century, lots of e exciting science was done. It's useless now. 
you can see the, the, you know, the city lights of Los Angeles. And there's actually a forest fire in that picture, too. But at least um, you know, as professional astronomers, at least we can still go to distant mountaintops and find a dark place. The problem with the satellite pollution is there is no dark place. You can launch um, uh, an, another 60 satellites um, from California. An hour later, they're flying over France. And, uh, and the, uh, the astronomer in France is going, what? Who said that was happening? Did I have what? So it's a global problem, and that's partly why it's so difficult. OK, so what, what, do we, what can we do about it? Um, maybe we just say, well, tough. You know, this is the way the world's going. Tough luck. Just get used to it. I hope not. Um, we could um, protest in some ways. So firstly, here's the selfish bit. Um, uh, I've written a book. Um, it's a non-technical book, a popular level book. It's called Losing the Sky. It's very, very cheap. One pound ninety nine for the e-book. Uh, so the idea is um, and so uh, please do recommend it to your friends, because the idea is it's not just as astronomers and, and astro fans. It's written so that you know, your auntie and your hairdresser can read it because I think this problem ought to be much better known other than just by astronomers. Um, so that's my selfish appeal. Uh, do spread the word because and it's quite good, honest. Um, uh, but also there's a couple of petitions going around, one intended for um, uh, professional astronomers, that's the one on top, and one intended uh, for the general public, and that's the one on the bottom. Uh, and, you know, you can complain to your, your MP and, and, and so on. Um, next, you could engage with um, industry. So this at the moment is what most of the work by professional astronomers has gone into. Once we realised how bad the problem was, a whole bunch of working groups are set up uh, under the International Astron Astronomical Union, the Royal Astronomical Society, the American Astronomical Society, People have been doing technical studies, um, trying to sort of push them through, sort of speaking to SpaceX and about, you know, in, you know making their satellites darker and, and so on. So this is really important. And the people who have done this have done a fantastic job. But I think it's not enough um, because it's just going to make things slightly better, um, but doesn't really cure the problem. Uh, litigate. So Americans, of course, are used to class action lawsuits. If you feel you're being damaged in a way that somebody didn't ask you about, then uh, you, you can potentially sue them. So you can see there I'm channeling Erin Brockovich, of course. I hope a lot of you have seen that movie. It's, it's really great. Um, uh, but there's no that typically that happens mostly in the U.S., um, uh, and only within one country. So it's pretty hard for a French astronomer to sue an American company. You know, I don't know how you go about doing that. There is a liability convention um, uh, set out by the UN, um, but it's very weak and it's only ever been used once. Um, to, and it's possible um, for one country to sue another if they feel that their spacecraft has caused some damage. So there you're looking at Canadians looking for the remains of a Russian um, satellite, Cosmos 954, um, uh, that was had a, a nuclear reactor in and land and it crashed into Canadian soil. And the Canadians sued the Russian government and eventually got them to pay some money. But that's only ever happened once. Uh, and again, if you're a random Joe, there's, there's, there's no chance you can do anything like that. Uh, finally, uh, and I'm going to uh, stop after this, um, regulate. So I think this, this is what we have to do because it should be possible for there to be good commercial activity um, and not ruin the sky for stargazers and for astronomers. It should be possible to do both. Um, um, but we need much better regulations. Um, and I think um, I my suspicion is that we're going to in space, we're going to go through the same transformation that the law of the sea did um, uh, a few decades ago. So I think this is where we have to head to as a global civilization to work out how to do this. Um, but it's going to take quite a long time. So I'm still nervous about what we do in the meantime. Um, OK, so that's all I have for you. And um, um, hope you I was going to say hope you enjoyed it. I'm not sure that's quite the right <laughs> expression. expression. 
uh, when, when I'm sort of ranting, ranting about something, something I, think I think this is a, this is a, is a problem. problem. Um, but but um, say, I, I just, just hope we can, can have our cake and, and eat it. it. But, but let's see. So that's my lot. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Andy. Andy. Uh, we, uh, have we have a few questions, questions that have come, come through. through. So, so the, the first, first one, one is, is, is the is impact, impact on astronomy considered, considered as part, part of the licensing, licensing process, process for satellites? satellites? Um, no, um, that was kind of precisely the point of my, um, uh, my, my last slide. That's an example of what has to, how the regulations have to change. So the moment the licensing process, either it's nationally, it's about, you know, you have to be seen as competent to be allowed to launch a rocket. Um, but that's not an international matter. You, you, that's a matter of your own uh, nation. Or internationally, um, regulations are almost entirely about radio frequencies. Radio frequencies are very heavily regulated and very carefully regulated. Um, but and now everybody's beginning to realise that damage is being done to other interests, but it's not yet in the regulations. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> and what, if anything, do you think is likely to be done about this? This being the satellite. It was an earlier question, so hopefully you've. Yeah, well, um, yes, I, uh, I don't know. Because as I said, I'm, I'm reasonably confident and hope that, you know, on a timescale of a number of years, that society, international society will sort this out and regulations will become more sensible. But the real worry is that this is all happening so fast, a lot of the damage will occur before we can get our act together. Um, so uh, I, so I, I don't know. So I'm a mixture of optimistic and pessimistic about this, actually. Yeah. And by 2029, will there be any risk to crew launches, presumably from the satellites? Um, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. Um, uh, I don't have a number for you. The, um, there must always be a, a, a risk. Um, in a, 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 um, I almost put in some pictures of the sort of damage that's been, for instance, to the solar panels of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope from little tiny you know, flecks of paint that are floating around and so on. Um, um, and, and we've had two near misses of major collisions um, over the last couple of years between satellites. Um, but it, what the probability is of, uh, you know, of uh, no, uh, something catastrophic to uh, a crew on the way up. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd quite like somebody to work it out. It would be, be an interesting number. Yeah, and final question. Would the issue be resolved if we moved our ground-based telescopes into space for astronomical science, not hobbyists, of course? And in a pandemic age, perhaps it's more important to have global connectivity for at-home education if the internet was made free for all? Um, right, that's a very interesting question. So, to the first one, of course, it'd be fantastic for all our telescopes in space. Who's paying for that? <laughs> right? Why should we have to? So that's um, that's 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 one point. Uh, and yes, in a pandemic, of course, it, as I said, of course, it's lovely that we want to connect the world up. You do not need forty thousand satellites in low Earth orbit to achieve that aim. You do not. Okay. It's it's as I said, it's all but that's all about the latency. It's not about making and yeah, but I think I think the internet should be free, should be like tap water. Well, it's you know, in the council tax, as it were. But most most people don't agree with that. I think it should be free. I think we should absolutely connect the world up. Um, but this is not the way to do it, and it's not necessary. Okay, great. Uh thank you for that. Um and We'll be passing over to John for our beer contest. Um, so, do I de de camerafy now? Is that the good thing to do? Yes, I think so. You, right then. <laughs> Thanks so much, Becky, and for that fantastic talk. Uh, hopefully, everybody can see me now. Me now. Uh, so, just a sort of a quick update from our last month's competition. Uh, so last month was our birthday. Uh, it was our three-year anniversary. Uh, I think it was, it was longer than that. I think we've had, we had a full anniversary last time. And one of our competitions we had the last time was to name an astronomy-related beer. So we would have seen the, the astronomy on. 
uh, Amy pop up last month with our contest. So we asked all of you guys out there to come up with some creative names for a space related beer. Uh, and we had a great response from everybody. So thank you all of you for, for giving your entries in. We had 16 different entries in total. Uh, and we managed to have a vote uh, between uh, a contentious vote between the AOT staff. There was lots of, you know, pint glasses, virtual pint glasses thrown across the bar. Absolutely crazy. But we managed to get down to a final three. Uh, and I will just share my screen now, if you bear with me one second. So we managed to whittle this down to a final. What we are going to do is we are going to put these up on our social media. So we'll pop them up on Twitter and pop them up on Facebook for everybody to have a vote. So what we'd like everybody to do is just go on Twitter, have a look, have a look at the poll we're going to put up just in a second and pick your favorite. We'll leave it up for a few days, maybe sort of five, six days to give everybody time to sort of get your followers looking up for these. But if you if your entry is up here, then please do get people to have a vote. And at the end, when we have a winner, uh, we're not sure what's going to happen next, but it'll be very exciting. We we have had uh, some beer suppliers come down to AOT before when we were in the pub, so possibly we're going to pass this on to some uh, to some people to see if they are interested in using the name. Uh, but I'll go through. So our first one was from uh, Chris Tunner, and that was the Olympus Mons Mead, which is our first entry. Option two was a simple one, just straightforward curiosity. Uh, David Archibald. That one sounds very much like it would be a part of a camera catalog somewhere in like a, a Derbyshire pub somewhere in the back of the uh, back of the hills. And our third option was the RPA, the Red Planet Ale. That was coming from Thompson Space. Uh, so if you do have, if you do see your entry up there, well done. You've made it to the final three. Uh, as we said, we'll pop these up on Twitter and stick it on Facebook for people to vote. So please do let us know which one's your favorite. And when we come back for next month's event, we'll let you know which one was the winner. So thank you ever so much, everybody. I'll pass back to you, Becky. Thank you, John. Um, we'll pass. We'll go on to our next speaker of the evening, um, which is Bill Barton. Bill joined the British Astron Astronomical Association Astronomical Association in 1984 and contributed to their solar section between 1990 and 2000. Also sharing his observations with the solar, with the solar division of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. In 2002, he was elected a founding member of the Society for the History of Astronomy and was elected fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. An early foray into astronomical history was a biography of Charles May and more recent work has been on Alice Grace Cook and Fiametta Wilson. Bill has a soft spot for classic telescopes such as the Swift Model 831 and the Carl Zeiss Telemeter, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, as well as Questa Maxitov, I, <laughs> I'm not sure I can pronounce that one. He owns some astronomical antiques such as eyepiece micrometers and plane spheres and or similar teaching aids. He has more old astronomy books than he likes to admit to. In January 2020, he was appointed as Deputy Director of the British Astronomical Association Historical Section. I will now pass over to Bill to avoid any spoilers for his talk titled Astronomers Find the Time. Thank you, Bill. Good evening, everybody. Um... I must admit to uh, blind panic at this point. Um, I have done several presentations uh, over the internet since COVID struck, but this is the first time I'm using Microsoft Teams. So I'm um, desperately trying to find my way around, as it were. Um, and what I really need now is somebody to tell me how I would share my screen with you. Ah, yes. Let me uh, share screen. There we are. And hopefully this is.
Right, I'll uh, I'll start now then. So, <clears throat> good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you can see from my title slide and my introduction, I am Bill Barton, and I am deputy director at the British Astronomical Association's historical section. So the BAA started back in 1890 um, and very soon established a reputation for observational astronomy. The historical section, on the other hand, uh, started in 1930 and we're much more interested in old stuff. Um, so old books, old telescopes, old observatories and, and things like that. And so uh, the subtitle for this talk, or the, the title even, is Astronomers Find the Time, or Why the Castle Gun is Fired at One O'Clock. So we'll start with a very basic question. What is the time? Well, the time is anything you want it to be, really. You can have any time you like, so long as you're prepared to travel. It's always five o'clock somewhere. So in the United Kingdom, at the moment, it's just after 8 p.m. Um, and then obviously the further west you travel, the earlier in the day it gets. But this doesn't just apply around the globe. It also applies within countries and um, right down to the smallest scales. Even the width of a room could make a difference as to what the time is one side to the other. And so the first chap to attack this problem was a Danish astronomer called Ole Roma. As you can see, he lived between 1644 and 1710. Um, and he was uh, at the university in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark. And he had this telescope. Um, and so it's a telescope pointed out a window. He's sitting in his what we would now call man cave and the telescope points out the window but it can only move up and down it is aligned on his local meridian that is his north south line as time passes different stars pass through the eyepiece of the telescope allowing him to find the time very accurately so if the star is betelgeuse the time must be whatever and if it's Vega, the time must be something else. This is, of course, sidereal time, time by the stars. As you can see on the left, he's got a pair of clocks. So you observe a particular star, you know what the time is, that that's due to pass the meridian, and you set the clock accordingly. And then any time after that you like, you can look at the clock to know the time. So you've got time finding and time keeping. On the other hand, if you used the sun rather than the stars at night, that would allow you to get directly to solar time. So this led to the practice known as grinding the meridian, where astronomers would stay up all night looking through telescopes. There were two versions of the instrument. The one on the left is called the transit telescope and the one on the right is the mural quadrant. So what you're really interested in with the transit telescope is timing the star as it passes across the eyepiece. And you can see the astronomer here has got a clock with a light on it so you can just about see the time. And the clock may well have been adapted to give a very loud tick. And the instrument on the right uh, a relatively small telescope, but a very large graduated arc to allow you to get a very accurate altitude for the measurement of the star. But of course, the Earth, as it goes round the sun, uh, is not in a circular orbit. It's in a very slightly elliptical orbit. And there are a few really quite basic uh, experiments you can do with quite simple telescopes uh, to demonstrate this and so what happens is that uh, early in the year the sun slows down a bit and then it speeds back up and then slows down and then speeds up and then slows back down and by the end of the year you get back to where you started from so if you looked through your telescope suitably filtered of course 
at uh, midday early in the year, you would have to wait five or six minutes before the sun appeared in the eyepiece. And then the maximum it goes to is about quarter past 12. And then I say it speeds up. And then October and November, it's really slow. It's uh, the sun rather is really fast. It transits uh, even before quarter to 12. So that's the equation of time. But you may not be on the standard longitude. The standard longitude for the United Kingdom is at Greenwich. Edinburgh is over three degrees west of this. <clears throat> and in terms of time, that's 12 minutes and 45 seconds. And of course, there's a correction to be added in if you want to be on summer time. So moving on from Ole Roma, here's the chap who put astronomical time finding on an industrial basis, Sir George Biddle Airy. He was seventh astronomer royal and he worked at Greenwich between 1835 and 1881. And as you can see, he was a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. He was five times president of that uh, group. He was also a fellow of the Royal Society and he was president there. So he, he was the top scientist. And even now, the Astronomer Royal is the only scientist within the Royal Household. And here's the instrument he used, his so-called transit circle which combined the transit telescope and the mural quadrant into one instrument. His particular uh, example was came into use in 1851, and through various accidents of history, it had to remain in service until 1954. So that was professional astronomers finding the time but, but what about everybody else, and in particular time distribution? Well, the first time distribution was a ball on the roof of the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, dropped at one o'clock. And it was all right if you were within sighting distance of the Royal Observatory. This is followed by telegraphic time distribution using the, the Victorian's equivalent of email to send out time signals. And this was done from 1852. Coming a bit closer to home, there is in Edinburgh at the Nelson Memorial, and the tower there had a time ball on the top of it from 1853. The time gun started in 1861 at the uh, instigation of a businessman called John Hewitt who had seen the idea in Paris. The BBC, well, they got in on the act in 1924. They only started broadcasting in 1922, so they were relatively fast on the uptake. And finally, uh, you could ring up to find the time on the speaking clock from July 1936. And of course, uh, this has kind of all been superseded now because we all have phones in our pockets and iPads and whatever. And if you want to know the time, you just look round and there it is on the screen for you. But of course, for people living out in the country in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, time was uh, very hard to find. So this uh, engineering entrepreneur called Josiah Latimer Clark uh, introduced his transit telescope, a relatively small instrument, uh, about inch, inch and three quarters in diameter and a foot in focal length. Uh, another version was this chap called John Short, a uh, rather obscure character. Uh, not much to do with astronomy. Uh, he came from uh, a family of scientific instrument makers and um, particularly shop scale manufacturers. Um, but he produced an instrument which he said was relatively easy to use um, and really quite small and therefore quite cheap. Uh, an even smaller instrument and perhaps pa even easier to use is Steinheil's passage prism. 
simply screwed to a, a door jam. You look through the little telescope and through a prism and you could see two images of the sun. And as noon approached, they coalesced into a single image. Uh, another instrument, um, and one I suspect was slightly more popular at the time, was Edward Dent's Diplidoscope, um, using a similar principle, but this time using a prism to reflect the image of the sun. Um, Dent's stock in trade was to manufacture clocks, um, but it, once he'd sold you a clock, he could then say, ah, oh, I can sell you another little instrument that will allow you to set the clock correctly. And so a ray of sunlight falls on the instrument. And again, you, you look at it and the two images of the sun coalesce at noon. And for the less uh, technically minded amongst his customers, he would al allow uh, one of his workmen to come out and set the instrument up for you at the rate of 10 shillings per day. Um, but what he didn't tell you was the chap had to be there when the sun shone exactly at noon. So how long the chap was hanging around waiting for the sun, I wouldn't like to say. So um, we're now coming back to um, the equation of time diagram. And so what I've done this time is the scale on the uh, left there of the times I've corrected to uh, Edinburgh time. And so you can see that the sun always transits at Edinburgh after midday and only there's only a little period in October and November when it's very slightly before midday and of course at midday the astronomers would be busy looking through the transit telescope to see the transit of the sun and so that is why the castle gun is fired at one o'clock simply because the transit of the sun has yet to occur. Thank you, Bill. Um, we have a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is, are any Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. So, are any of these instruments still on show at the Edin um, in Edinburgh at the observatory? Um, not as far as I'm aware. No. Um, the airy transit instrument at Greenwich is on display. Um, <clears throat> that, say, came into use in 1851 to mark the Greenwich Meridian. And then in 1884, there was an international conference to set the prime meridian for the world, which was set again in Greenwich. So that's when it became the prime meridian for the world. Um, but occasionally, if you follow things like eBay and other uh, antique uh, sites, uh, sale sites on the internet. Um, you can find these instruments coming up for sale every once in a while. And it's just a nice little sort of thing to have sat on your desk, really. Yeah. And was the fog in Edinburgh one of the reasons the gun firing helped people to tell the time? Um, possibly. Um, like the time ball at Greenwich, you had to be looking in the right direction at the right time. Um, and if you were indoors or, you know, not looking in the right direction when the ball dropped, you wouldn't have seen it. But an acoustic signal can be heard by anybody just, you know, by listening out for it. Yeah. And are any of these instruments still in use after the introduction of UTC? No, is the short answer. Uh, basically, they have all been superseded. Um, and in fact, the, the Greenwich Meridian o over time, um, because of the layout of the site, um, has actually moved. Each time there was a new Astronomer Royal, he wanted a new and better telescope than his predecessor had. 
and they couldn't be erected sort of north south of each other. They had to go east west, and so the the Grange Meridian has slightly moved. Um, and uh, or oh, when was it in the nineteen twenties? Uh, after Aries' time, uh, they ran out of room at the observatory and they erected a new observatory in Greenwich Park. And so the Greenwich Meridian is actually technically no longer on the Airy Transit Circle. And how much is it moved by? It's currently uh, 19 feet east of the Airy instrument. Um, yeah. But of course, if if you look through a telescope and you see the the star disappearing behind the crosswires in the eyepiece, um, it's very easy to work out the difference between where you are and the Greenwich Meridian. So you can always kind of back calculate to, to zero. So um, has that effect da datum definitions? Um, I've just been sent that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, because we, we, we now have um, atomic time. Keep an eye on these things. You will notice once in a while we have a thing called a leap second inserted, um, which is to keep the two in alignment. Um, and in fact, I was reading the other day that, that um, the Earth is apparently now very slightly speeding up. And so there may need there may have to be a negative leap second. Oh. Um, I think that's all of the questions, so I'll be passing back to John, I think, for our speaker game. Thanks so much, Becky, and thank you very much, Bill, um, for that talk. That was really, really interesting. It's the first time we've had a historical astronomical talk, I think, in all of the time we've had AOT, so that was really fascinating. Thank you ever so much. Um, so we've, we've now sort of come to the, the final game of of this evening and bill i know you joined a little later so you weren't aware of this so i apologize for for ambushing you somewhat <laughs> uh what we know we like to do especially as we've now gone online that we can't sort of be in a nice a nice pub somewhere and, and offer you both a drink and and have a chat afterwards we like to have a bit of a game at the end where we like to involve our our guest speakers um so what we're going to do is we're going to to invite um andy and bill um to take part in in, in the game yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you click on that, there you go. Brilliant. Thanks, Bill. Um, so, Bill, and if, if you want to get your there, you are. So we've got you there. So um, what we like to do is we do and it's not I promise you it's nothing taxing. Uh, we always have our speakers sort of slightly nervous, slightly sweating towards the end, thinking they're going to get tested on on astronomy or some sort of like uh, some some deep knowledge. But it's, it's, it's fairly easy. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen so you can both see. And hopefully you can both see this come up. Bear with me one second. OK. So and hopefully my screen should be coming up just now. Can you go see that? Yeah. You should have yeah. a giant Google thing yes. sort of sticking in the core of the earth there. So uh, the game that we're going to play is called Google Feud. Uh, which is uh, it's a special version of Google Feud. So eventually Google Feud is a game where you are given um, the starting point of someone typing something into Google as part of a question. And then Google, as we know, as, as wonderful algorithmic uh, ways, comes up with some suggestions. So it comes up with uh, suggestions of how to complete your answer. And this is usually the most searched for terms on Google for that particular sentence. So this is going to be uh, an astronomy edition of that. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you five different uh, questions, astronomy related questions uh, with the starting point of that question. And then I've, what I've done is I've taken the top five suggestions from Google. So I'm going to ask you both. I'm going to show you the, uh, the start of the question and then I'm going to ask you both just to take a second to have a think about it and come up with what you think one of those answers might be. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK. So and again, is all, all it is, don't worry if you're right or wrong. So all I'm going to do is the top answer. If you manage to get the top answer, which I'll be very impressed if you do, then that's two points. If you manage to get one of the top five, that's one point. And there are five questions. So if you are an absolute genius, 
There are <laughs> 10 points on offer. If you are sort of, you know, middle of the road, there might be five, but we should see how this goes. Normally, we end up with a very tight finish. Right, right. 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 We went with, I went with a very simple one first, and I did test all these out, and these are all, mm-hmm. you know, properly vetted screenshots. I, I can cite my sources, at Google. Um, so basically, why is space? And I'd just like you to know, what did Google suggest? So if you both have a think for a second, just have a think uh, of how to end that sentence. I'll give you just a few seconds to have a think. Okay. All right, so Andy, I'll come to you first as you are our first speaker. What was your, why is space, what? Expanding. Why is space expanding? Okay, and Bill, what was your suggestion? Empty. Why is space expanding? Why is space empty? The top five suggestions were, why is space dark? Why is space travel important? Why is space cold, a vacuum? And why is space called space okay. oh, I was, I was going to say dark oh. <laughs> I would have, that would have been two points off the back oh. there you go so unfortunately we started off with a with a nil nil draw on the first <laughs> question <laughs> that half point for empty being the same as a vacuum wow well, I mean I think you're assuming the audience who's doing these questions know the difference between empty and a vacuum but I will I will I will well, we'll see what the next question is. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Yeah. We'll see how we okay. go. So, okay. Okay. question two. Is the Earth blank? So, I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Is the Earth blank? Okay, Bill, I'm going to come to you first for this one. Is the Earth what? Moving. Is the Earth moving? Andy? Flat. Ooh, interesting. Mm. Wow, that's, that's definitely an interesting one. We've gone for your Google. You know you know your Google is there. Mm. All right, so is the Earth moving and is the Earth flat? Is the Earth spinning faster, bigger than the moon, perfectly round, getting closer to the sun and tilted? Wow, that's... <laughs> I'll tell you what. Mm. I... Go on, go on, Andy. No, I'm saying uh, we're, we're, we're hopeless so far. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Moving and spinning faster, that is almost there. And I should give a half point for vacuum. So I'm going to give you both a half point so you're equal. So, so far, half point each. Okay, so don't worry. It's, it gets easier. <laughs> Question three Do meteorites? So, how can we complete this sentence? Do meteorites? Andy? Land on Earth. Land on Earth. Bill? Oh, I was going to say something very similar. Um, I do allow, if I, I, this is why I've given you the space. If you come up with the same answer, I will believe you both because you're obviously very, you know, you are guests with integrity. <laughs> so I do believe you. Um, yes, two meteorites land on the earth. Yes. Yeah. Both gone with two meteorites <laughs> land on the earth. The answer was. Yes, the top mm, answer for both yay. of you. Well done. Excellent. People do also ask about, do they have radiation? Do they make noise? Do they contain gold? And do they have holes in them? So I think that could also relate to cheese as well. But obviously, they've gone. Those are all answer. really good questions. <laughs> yeah, they're all. I'm, I'm, I mean, when I started this game, I thought this might be a way to sort of, you know, have fun at people who use Google. But apparently the world is a lot more intelligent than I gave them credit for. Uh, so Going into our last two questions, we are tied at two and a half, two and a half. This is very exciting. Okay, question four. Is Venus what? I'll give you a couple of seconds to have a think about that. Is Venus what? Hey, so I'm going to come to you first on this one, Bill. Is Venus? Is Venus a planet? Interesting. Is Venus a planet, Andy? It is Venus hotter than the Earth? Ooh, is Venus a planet? Is Venus hotter than the Earth? So our top five were... Is Venus a gas planet? Is Venus bigger than the Earth? Hotter than Mercury? Hot or cold? And is Venus... <laughs> <with the Earth? laughs> 
married. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> so I thought, I, I, I'll, I'll have to give Bill a point, I think. Is Venus a gas planet? I think we can mm-hmm. give you a point for that. That's about there. But Andy, I don't think we got the hotter than the Earth one. We did get hotter than Mercury, bigger than the Earth, uh-huh. but not quite. So going into our final round, Bill, you were on three and a half. Andy, you were on two and a half. Our final question is, did Buzz Aldrin what? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about this. A couple of seconds. Did Buzz Aldrin. Okay, Andy, you're up first. What did Uh, Buzz Aldrin? This is a bit depressing, but I fear the answer is going to be, did Buzz Aldrin go to the moon? That's a strong answer. Mm. Bill, what was your thoughts? Yes, uh, that was going to be my answer as well. Did Buzz Aldrin go to the moon? Okay, well, the top, and this is genuinely true, the top five answers on Google when you put this in, did Buzz Aldrin pee ah. on the moon? Did Buzz Aldrin die? Did he walk <laughs> on the moon first? Did he get on with Neil Armstrong? <laughs> and did he want to be first? So I like how Googlers have gone for, you know, did he go to the loo? Uh, did he die? And was there any drama on the spaceship? So it's nice that they've got their priorities straight. Well, I, so, I agree with you, John, that this exercise has um, uh, reconfirmed my faith in humanity. <laughs> <laughs> very little will, conspiracy nuts here. So <laughs> <laughs> I will say, yeah, no, I, was, I was very happy about this, too. I will say we have had in the past uh, a lot of things about toilets. We had the deepest toilet. <laughs> Uh, down in Bulby with the experiment because uh, Jinran works on that experiment. We talked about the coldest toilet over in Antarctica and the highest toilet on the on the International Space Station. So I'm glad we we continued on that theme. It's keeping us keeping us good. So, um, Bill, you are our winner. Congratulations uh-huh. with with three and a half points. You are our winner. So well done. Thank you for playing both of you. Thanks mm-hmm. for being good, such good sports. We appreciate it. Um, and I shall now finish my segment. Uh, so thank you to you both, and I shall hand back to Becky. Thank you, John. All is left to say is thank you to both the speakers for tonight and to the audience for their attention and brilliant questions. If you could take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel, that would be much appreciated as it really helps us a lot. We'll be back next month on the 11th of May, but in the meantime, have a wonderful evening. So thank you so much. <laughs>